Um, I made a list of the things I'm most worried about. And it's a long, nasty list. And it's not based on fantasy or fiction. It's based on all the things that are collectively happening all at the same time this very evening somewhere on the planet. In other words, the list of conditions that we're going to talk about okay. will be manifesting to their completion somewhere on the planet. I'll leave a go at that. All right. Let's start by considering the facts of the world's overpopulation. I mean, just start there, for instance. Not, not that we can do anything about it, but just how about that one? Is that not big enough? Now we've got all this global warming debate, and as you know, I do not ascribe to either either global warming or global cooling. I'm 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 in the camp that suggests, and it's pretty much supported by fact, especially science fact, that they can't prove global warming is man-made. All they know is that there is appears to be a sudden increase in CO2 emissions, which come from a number of things, including cows and, and gasoline engines and this and that. But nobody ever talks about the fact that when one single global big old jumbo volcano lets go, like Vesuvius, or or the 120 other, did you know we have at least, at least 120 major volcanoes at this time? All erupting uh, across the planet. Uh, no one's talking about it. And those can are just. Name, those, can you name the top five? I don't think so. And those, we don't talk about that, Michael. Don't you dare talk about it now. Those are just the ones on oh. land, right? We're not even considering the ones under the uh, ocean. Yeah. Right? Well, what's happening is the ring of fire is coming alive. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Maybe tonight would be a good night to talk about the ring of fire. But I want to go on. So, <clears throat> my second one was this global warming initiative which has been a real money maker for many 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 people we won't we don't have to name them we already know who they are and i believe that our planet is simply going through a state of very confusing signals from the sun so let's start there let's go let's go there all right everything and anything that happens to this planet has to do with its connection to the sun. Without the sun, there would be no life on planet Earth. There would be no life on Earth. Earth would probably be a frozen void completely. Its oceans would be solid ice for thousands of feet thick. Without the sun, nothing good comes upon the Earth. I've been pr proposing since, uh, how long do I been talking now? Eight, nine years at least, right? Seven years? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's been seven years. All right. And the, after the book, the book's been released. It was released in, in 2007. The book we're talking about is, is The Arrival and Return of Planet X. And it covers a span of time from 1983 to the present. And the way I left the book in writing, I left the present to be looked at as any day following the last day you wrote the book. In other words, once you have read that book and everything that you experience, which I'm going to talk about here in this one paragraph, you will experience by reading the book. And then when you're finished, you'll suddenly see it all play out before you. Because now you'll understand what's driving the planet to its apparent confusion and, and uh, <clears throat> undecidedness and, and <clears throat> weird winters and hot summers and changing ocean currents and, and huge global impact uh, situations such as the jet stream being forced almost a thousand or more miles off its normal range of flow across the United States and around the rest of the planet. Look at Buffalo. Look at that. So it's seven, eight feet of snow in yeah. some areas. Yeah. There's obviously something wrong. And my sympathies go to Buffalo. I used to live in Chicago. I hated Chicago weather in the winter. It was dreary, Michael, for two months at a time. You never saw the sun. Never. Anyway, um, there's something really, really, really wrong with the weather systems that are driving this 
planet. Now, why aren't we talking? Why isn't the science? Why isn't NASA openly investigating that? What's causing these weather aberrations? Exactly. We all know what it is, but they won't. They won't discuss it. No such thing as global warming. There's no global cooling. Right now, we're going through phases of both super warming and super cooling, like we're experiencing at this moment. It's cold all the way down to Florida. That's very rare these days, or should be very rare. Now it's becoming quite common. So, I think that there's no such thing as global warming. What's happening is the sun is being perturbed. Do you know what the word perturbations means? I certainly do. I've had six One. kids. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm talking about one heavenly body affecting the other because of its mass and its electromagnetic field, and what, you know, what we call them, one mass object, one huge magnet affecting another magnet. You see, we're one huge electrical magnet planet. It's, 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 if you only understood how brilliant it was, whoever designed, and Michael, and you, hey, everybody out there, can you imagine the scope of the computer program that had to be designed to create just the Earth, just the Earth. Forget all the other planets in our in our solar system. Just the Earth. Yeah, yeah. It it it, it came to a billion billions of years of, of uh, uh, environmental change, and and of course, you know, the planet grew and matured. It, it probably our planet is probably somewhere between nine and a half and twelve billion years old as part of our solar system. We have to understand how complicated the solar system is. All right. Oh, Michael, here we go. We're jumping off the bridge again. All right. <laughs> I, I get so many letters, and I get so many very, very nice commentaries. People send me stuff all the time and destroying it. What these guys and women should do out there if they have any questions is Get us an intelligent email, and if it's a question we can answer, we'll answer it. Michael and I are very open to your thoughts and ideas. I don't want to stray too far, but we do have two and a half hours. And we haven't talked in a heck of a long time. That's right. And you had a heart attack. I hate to go back to that, but I'm shocked. No one told me. Yeah, I. Uh, it was um, September 7th. It was about, oh, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. And, uh, uh, Were you on the air? Uh, no, it was a Sunday, so uh, it, oh. yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was no fun. I'll just say that, but uh, I have recovered uh, pretty okay. good. I had a uh, the main artery to my heart was a hundred percent clogged. Oh, oh, oh! Yeah. Not a good thing. So good. they put a stent in. Well, I'm lucky they were able to stent it because if not, they would have wanted to do some open heart uh, surgery, and nah, Mike don't like that. <laughs> I understand. I understand. <clears throat> well, I'm I'm I am very happy that you you are here and that you're functioning and that you're well and that you're eager. So let's continue. All right. I want to close off this global warming, global cooling issue. Whatever affects the sun from space, the sun will either react or replenish or 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 it will rebalance itself because the forces that are affecting the sun right now are from this serious body, which we've agreed with, is called Planet X, but it's really not. It's Wormwood that's talked about in the book of Revelation in chapter 8, verse 11, and the name of the star is Wormwood. Um, we're not going negative. We're not negative. No, we're not going to go negative, nor are we going to go religious. But all of my research over dozens of years traveling all over the place talking to some really great people there is no way to separate at least in, in terms of the mystery of what planet X is there is such a tremendous biblical connection that it's, it's another reason I wrote the book and, I, and I, by the way I told all about what it was in the book it's, it's just kind of a mystery by the way it's not only is it educational but I wrote it as a mystery well, let me ask this. Real and there's there's a code there's a code in there just toward the end about about the dates that you and I have been talking about. I wrote about those seven, eight, nine years ago. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I was I wanted to ask um, 
how do we know for sure that uh, see for me i know for sure that our ancestors seen something in the sky they wrote about it um Nibiru, uh you know call it what you will but they, you know something happened then there's no no question about that but how do we know that it wasn't just that one time thing and that it's not coming back again or how do we know it's not parked somewhere nearby and and never left let's 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 go back to its origin real quick i'll try to do this how much before, how much time do we have before the break um well actually my clock was wrong let me, we have we actually have 15 minutes now until oh anyway. well i want let me do a quick review of how this whole thing came into either myth or reality let let, let me Remember how we, I, I do my explanation of the collision? Let me. Many of you have heard this before, but and but everybody loves hearing it, so I'm going to reiterate it again. This is how I believe, through my research and and my emotion involved and all of the evidence that I've seen, read, and touched. This is how I believe Planet X was born. Let's jump back in time. To 12 billion years ago, when it's believed, actually, we weren't back there then, but it was believed that our solar system was put together. See, everybody thinks that you know, first there was the sun, and then there was this, and then many years later, the moon came. And, uh, no. No. The Earth was put to the Earth, and all of the planets, in their perfect alignment, in their perfect position, Left the asteroid belt because there wasn't one. There were originally 12 planets that were designed to fulfill and serve this solar system. Okay. Notice I didn't say for mankind, it was for the solar system. It had nothing to do with mankind. That comes way, 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 way later. There were originally 12 planets in this solar system and there were three suns. Our system is a tertiary star system, one more beyond binary, which by the way, most solar systems or grouping of planets that we've discovered so far all seem to have at least two suns or more. Yeah. Okay? That's just how it is. And in our sector of the Milky Way, it's even more apparent because we have found this to be the common figure, not the unusual one. So why would it seem so strange that there might be three suns associated with the origin and the construction of our solar system? We have Mother Sol, the sun we see and love every morning, rises in the east. Didn't always, by the way, but now it rises in the east. And then we have the big blue black giant so powerful and so big a star it could almost be its own black hole but it's not it's anchored a billion or more miles from us out in the direction of Orion and it's so hard to detect because it's almost blue, it's blue black so hot it is the anchor star for our star Sol Something has to control our sun. Look at how big it is. You think it just controls itself? No. It has a governor, and the governor, you know what a governor does in an engine, Michael? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I believe that this big blue black giant acts like a governor on our sun. And that's what I think creates the sunspot cycles and other phenomena. But let's. Let's go back to the origin of the solar system. There were three suns. You have the giant blue black, which I just described. You have the little baby stars I'm ahead of myself. You have Sol, and then who's the mother sun, and then you have the mother sun's baby. Now this baby sun was belched out, yelling and screaming. You understand? This one was pumped out of the heart of the sun, and eventually it became the size of the present day planet Saturn. In other words, this baby sun was possibly the size of, of the present day planet Saturn, but 60 times its mass. 60 times. It's okay. a lot of mass. A lot of mass. And it was at this point, let's jump back 
about five and a half to six billion years ago. We have to go in between the halves because the research enables us to look at it in clear vision, but it doesn't always give a precise timeline. You have to work towards your timeline. Yeah. That, I guess that would be a subject for another show, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. So the timeline on this one says that about five and a half to six million years ago, our solar system was well on its way to becoming a functioning, working, livable, some, on some planets, by the way, we believe there were at least two. Mars and Earth had life and water on them, and little Venus also was a very tropical planet with water. But then the terrible thing happened. So we believe that there were at least three planets capable of bearing life. That was the original game plan that whatever or whomever the God Force was that created it had it all figured out way before it happened. Now, these other some of the other planets were gaseous planets, which we know about. And there was this very weird, strange, colossal piece of rock which the ancients named Marduk. And Marduk resided between Mars and Jupiter. And it just was there. And that, by the way, is the exact location of the present-day asteroid belt. So why, why, why is that important? Well, in the beginning, there was no asteroid belt. There was a planet called Marduk, which was positioned, we believe, presently where the asteroid belt is. And we don't need to go into the asteroid belt. I think everybody knows what that is. It's a bunch of rocks. Yeah. Billions and billions, as a great professor. Billions and billions of them. There were possibly one other living planet called Nibiru. Now we're gonna now we're gonna plot into the story a little bit deeper here because everybody thinks of planet X is Nibiru and Nibiru is no, no, no. It's not what Zachariah Sitchin said, or that's not what he wrote about. He claimed that there was, and it was called the 12th planet. The question is, if it was the 12th planet, what, where was its position? See, that you have to ask. If it was, it could have been the 12th planet, because there were rumored to be 12 planets, at least three or four with life. And if Nibiru was also being groomed as a planet with life, then the next question to solve is what about Nibiru's connection with the Nephilim and all the stories in the Bible. And you see, you see how treacherous a road this can be? Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't make that connection to create cacophony, you see? Right. Everywhere I turn, there's a biblical implication. Somewhere, somehow, as hard as I tried. Michael, I tried for six years not to thread the needle through the thread as good as I did, because when I got the mitt done, not only, not only had I sewn my hand shut with obstacles trying to figure out what I was trying to figure out, but I didn't see the answer staring me right in the face. And what, what tipped it all off, because I've been working on this book, oh, I don't know, eight, nine years, maybe ten years altogether, writing, researching, notes, stuff. And suddenly, I'm leaping through the, the book of Revelation, because somebody told me to go to chapter 8. What happened was, somebody, one, one of my friends called me and said, you know what, I was reading your book, I didn't realize. I said, you know, well, I mean, the, I, I thought I realized, and this all had to do with Wormwood. It's right there in the book of Revelation. So I, hadn't, I was not even aware of its connection until I got this call from this friend of mine, and there it was. And I started reading chapter 8, and it's all about the tribulation, the, the earth's tribulation, both both from natural forces and man-made tribulation, as as in as in the end time. Okay, so I get to chapter eight, 
and I suddenly see the words, and the name of the star is Wormwood. This is after all the other religious and scientific evidence merged, and I could, there was no getting away from it. An atheist, a devout atheist, would have to admit to the truth of what I was presenting. And it all fell into place in the cornerstone, the cornerstone, was the book of Revelation and this whole thing with Wormwood because every 3,600 years this phenomenon occurs where the celestial body sometimes plays havoc with our solar system because it was originally part of it which is what I'm going to get to I think I want to save that climax thing until after the break and I'll work our way up to it on that all right, that sounds good. Tell you what, why don't we take that break now? All right, so we are back. We've got a whole lot of time. We don't have another break for an hour, so let's do this. All right. Well, first of all, <clears throat> the message is the message, but I have to commend you on your bumper intro. That was brilliant. I've never heard it before. Well, thank you. You produced that. Uh, yeah, I, I put it together. Um, so It was brilliant. Well, How many overlays were there? Uh, actually, just a few. I, I kind of got lucky with it. I, I had a little time when I, I'd hooked things up the other night, and I just started searching, and I came across a, a few pieces, and I said, boy, would these be good, really good together. So together you are they are. One, <laughs> you are one strange dude. Yeah, I, I like being strange. Strange <laughs> is great. <laughs> no, I loved it. I loved it. You know, you know that I, too, have a background in music besides all this metaphysical mumbo jumbo stuff you know like like Sherman McLean by the way I have a fabulous experience to tell about a situation with Sherman McLean and by the way I also did her radio show she was very very sweet nice yeah anyway <clears throat> I suddenly realized about halfway doing the research on this book that I was starting to have kind of a religious awakening experience after years and years and years of I really don't need anything because I'm not really that bad a person coming from my Catholic batter childhood. <laughs> well, you won't talk about me and the nun again. Well, we, well, we better not. <laughs> so, <laughs> this sweet little innocent, you realize I went to confession seven mornings a week I went to communion seven mornings a week from kindergarten until about fifth grade yeah that's when the okay. NSA had to sneak around <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I mean I was at the confessional more than I was you know doing my lollipop you know alright so I had always had this kind of pseudo reservation I mean, when you, when you have it crammed down your throat. Yeah, I, I guess I need to talk about, see, this is what I was afraid of. The moment you and I get off target for the, for the best of reasons and the best of intentions, you know, I need to tell you the story. I had a totally physical, totally conscious experience with the Virgin Mary in a stone grotto as a child of 11 after the big fight with the nun where I knocked her out, I thought I killed her. When I, left, <laughs> when, I, when I left the classroom, there she was, Sister Mary Rosetta, lumped in this horrible position, her leg juxtaposed, her head, she had a gash in the back of her head where she hit the back of the back of the chalkboard and the piece of chalk cut her. But my fist landed square nose and I broke her nose and her glasses until she passed out. She fell goodness. back against, it was awful. She fell back against the, the blackboard, and I could hear her nail <laughs> down there. And she looks up to the class and she says, Save me! That was the last thing she said before she passed out. She looked at the crib, all the kids screaming, You killed sister! You killed sister! <laughs> so I had, to, I had to get out of there. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Then the, then the fight at the foot of the outside, 11 bullies quickly ran out of the building pushing pushing this little kid that was no more than about six years old out ahead of him <laughs> like he was their commanding general they confront me <laughs> they confront me outside the 
church. No, outside the school, we had some upstairs, like two levels. And they come bursting out the door. I could hear them screaming, yelling, coming down the hall. Get him! Get him! He killed sister! Get him! <laughs> and these are the guys, these are the same guys that have been tormenting me for a year because she picked on me. She called me Dumbo and she pulled me by my ear and she constantly hit me with the backside of the pointer and I, I was too stubborn and too dumb. I would hardly wimp until they would the say, no, 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 no. You know, joking. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. So I had this big fight with these 11 bullies, and what do they do? They send this little sweet kid who, who uh, his name was Benny. And I don't know why, but he made it, he befriended me in the playground. I'm, I'm much older than him. But he found a comfort in talking to me. And they shoved poor little Benny out at me as if Benny is going to take me down. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, after 10, 15 minutes of fierce fighting, I swear to you on, 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 on Mother Mary's sanctified vows that there was not one of them standing, and I'm the one who walked away, and the little kid, who was so terrified, waved goodbye to me, and I walked away. The kids ran up back into the school because it was raining like crazy. And I started walking to the park, because that's where I always went for refuge, was the park, beautiful Palmer Park. But it's April, and it's cold, and it's almost foggy. It's probably no more than 45 degrees in early April. And I get castigated. I'm out of the, I'm out of the school building, and I'm walking past the, 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 uh, the, the, the place where the nuns are in. What's that called, Michael? Oh, Not the nunnery. I know what you're talking the about. The convent, convent, yeah. convent, convent. The convent. So I had to walk past the convent. And as I'm walking past the convent where the sister Mary Rosetta will probably be taken if, if in fact I killed her, as I'm walking by, I'm my little soul saying to myself, and this is where they're going to bring her body. Remember that. Isn't that an awful thing to be thinking? This is how guilty I felt. <laughs> Can I ask what, what led up to knocking her out? <laughs> well, she beat up on me every day. And this time, oh, what what pursue? Oh, okay, I can do that in a minute. Okay, that particular day we were doing, I think it was World Global History, and it was how absolutely marvelous Columbus was and all the wonderful things that he did, and he discovered America and blah, 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 blah. all the facts were wrong. All she was spewing at us was a generalized, overized, oversized view of, of how she saw it, not how it was in reality, when in fact, Christopher Columbus was the first man, sailor, to introduce slavery into the world. He brought back slaves. No one ever talks about that. Horrible. He also Horrible killed, thing. He killed he a lot of people, the, too. Yes. Yes. So, I listen and listen and listen to this stuff and so that day came Columbus, when, when, when the Columbus Day came she started in again because I had heard all this in the 5th grade see I got stuck with her in the 5th and the 6th grade <laughs> can you imagine my despair Michael my utter crushing despair when I walked into the 6th grade class determined to make a new start she was she, in 5th grade she <laughs> destroyed my entire world of the school I don't mean to laugh, yeah. but boy, this that's the settings of a of a, a good funny oh, it's, Christmas it's, it's movie. It's like an Ag Agatha Christie murder, you know. Like, <laughs> and I got away with murder because I was sure I had killed her, right? Yeah. yeah. What happened was that day, she brought up the subject of Columbus again, and, I, and I'm I'm not sure why she brought it up. All I thought to myself was, "Oh crap, here we go again." <laughs> And I raised, I raised my hand, as much as me as the Lord, she said, now I want you to solve that equation. She said, and I want you to do it now. This was the equation that the class had no idea where she got it from. Nobody knew. I was, and I got, and how I figured it out was, my uncle, remember I told you my uncle, the one, the one that was one of the Roswell photographers, remember? Oh yeah. yeah. My uncle Sam. Well, he taught me, I mean, he helped me figure out the equation, so I just had it in my head, right? Well, I thought to 
myself, yeah, I got the equation, and I'll be damned if I'm going to give it to you. And I picked a piece of chalk, and I broke the piece of chalk, big, white, long piece of chalk, and I put it in the tray, and I said, you solve it. Well, she <laughs> reared back, and she raised up. What she used to do is, you know, the big old thick pointers with the big ha fat handle and the thin points with the rubber thing on it? Remember oh, those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, she'd turn it around, and she'd have the skinny part in her hand, and she'd hit me across the back and the shoulders and the neck sometimes with the fat end. <laughs> and all the kids thought that was the, yay, ooh, it was great. It was like, you know, kick the slave, you know? Yeah. Well, and anyway, I thought to myself, no, not today. You know, I said, my little self, I'm 11 years old. In fact, I had a birthday coming up. I was soon to be 12 years old. I was going to be a big boy. And I thought to myself, hey, sis, not today, not this time. So I see the big fat butt of the, of the um, pointer coming right down, aimed right at my neck and my back. And I simply step back and I grab it out of her hand, pull it back. She totally loses control, busily spins out, and she starts flying at me with her hands and her fingers like claws coming at me. And I simply step back. <laughs> this is horrible, Michael. And I nailed her with a punch. That spun her around and that she, she smashed into the back of the blackboard and it split all the way down 20 some feet it split Michael from where her head hit and it went all the way down to the end of the last row <laughs> that was probably a thousand dollars damage right there <laughs> I have all this guilt going on and I'm walking past the nunnery and you know there's a convent and then my, my little boy says you know this is where they're going to bring this body you can kill so on the next thing you come to is this sunken, beautiful, white limestone grotto built in honor of and in tribute to the Blessed Virgin. And there is a statue, a pretty big one, six-foot statue of Mary. And it's in traditionally, she's in, whoever painted it, it's, they keep it up in her, in her royal blue and her rosary in her hand and the halo and the whole thing the statue and it's really really impressive Michael you, you, you almost have to say wow that looks like that's a real you know person and it sits on a white altar and then there there is a whole uh, uh, row where you can kneel and make a petition and say a prayer and light a candle etc you see mm -hmm. for the grotto it was a, a grotto to the blessed virgin Mary well I would often go there in my moments of terror with the nun, because that was the only place that I found solace and peace and quiet away from her brutality was to go there. And I was fine. I'd be able to refresh and go back in and take the rest of the afternoon and go crap from her. So, it's raining like I'm soaked to the bone. I am absolutely, utterly soaked. I've got my coat in my hand. I should have my coat on my shoulder. I'm dragging my coat. I've got my books. My, the book bag is torn. I had a really nice leather book bag. It was torn. And I'm approaching the grotto. And I look in, and it's pouring rain down in the grotto. Pouring rain on the statue. And there were candles, but, of course, they were all wet. And I thought, well, you know what? This has been a really crappy day. Maybe I should get down, even in the rain. Get, come on. Get down on my, my knee on the stone and beg the forgiveness of the Virgin Mary because I just killed one of her nuns. That's what my little heart was telling me. She sure looked dead to me. There was blood everywhere. So, I'm walking by it, and I had this unbelievable supernatural urge my body just turned immediately abreast the middle of the stairwell and I started walking down without even knowing why or what force brought me there or made me do it. And I cleared the first landing, which was about 
three steps, and when I hit the second landing, better get ready, everybody. As if you threw a light switch, it was a beautiful, clear, warm April morning. And the birds were singing, and the sun was shining, and the candles were lit. And my, I was totally dry. I looked at my bag. My bag was not ripped. I was completely dry. And my little boy said, go say a prayer of thanks. So I put the bag down and I, well, next to me, and I, I knelt down on this little altar that's there. And I'm looking up at the statue. I look up at that statue a hundred times. And all of a sudden, her eyes opened. And then, I can't explain how, but the statue transformed into a being. And I had this conversation. And I was completely exonerated by her of any evil intent. I was even relieved of the charge of disorderly conduct that I was in fact protecting my life and my limb from the superior force. And um, she said, you know, go thy way and sin no more. May the Lord please be with you. And that is over. Curiously enough, I never saw the eyes closed. That was interesting. Hmm. It just, the statue was just, just like it was. Has anyone else ever reported the statue doing these things? I heard about, I don't know if it's in Canada, but uh, mm -hmm. a similar statue that has been, they've said that it's cried, tears of blood, and things mm -hmm. like that. There are many, uh, there are actually many, many such places and sites and, and relics. No, not, not to my knowledge. Um, I very, 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 very rarely tell that story, by the way. I've because actually, most, I think most I've only... People, most people couldn't quite put a handle on that. I think I've heard it only one other time from you, Dr. Rand, and it was quite a while ago. Yeah, well, that had a profound impact on my life. And suddenly, I never had any doubts about anything concretely religious. But after that experience... There was just this period of, of withdrawal from the church in general. I'd go to Mass now and then, but my heart wasn't really in it. And I, then I just stopped. And I tried to make myself morally, um, morally, morally accurate and, and, you know, spiritually aligned and all that stuff. Not excluding God, but just not being thrust into it. And then, and then, the whole thing with the, the, the thing, Quetzalcoatl's tomb. You know where? You know who Quetzalcoatl was? Not offhand. I've heard of him. Quetzalcoatl was the legendary serpent god of the early Central American Indians, the Incas, the Incas, and the Peruvians, and all of those. They all had this common denominator with the serpent god. Well, I was fortunate enough. Oh, my misadventure. What brought me? No, what brought me to Florida? Here we go. I guess we're getting ready for the Bermuda Triangle part. I was very fortunate in that I was a research associate and diving associate of the late Dr. J. Manson Valentine and the award winning book author Charles DeWitt. I was part of their research team as they were writing the Bermuda Triangle book which is a legendary book. I'm sure you're aware of that before, I hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I was able to fly with them and dive with them and swim with them and we discovered relics and shipwrecks and high we even found the pirate ship one. And actually had to flee for our lives. Long story. That's another show. And I came to realize that what they were, what were lit and and, and also George Van Tassel, the guy who, who, who built the Integratron. Well, there's a show. 
I lived out on the grounds of the Integratron for about a year and a year and a half. Talk about UFOs and ETs and everything. That's another show too. Um, I realized that this whole thing was coming together. All this mumbo jumbo stuff, you know, me, the good I had experience at 11 on the ship up in Canada. We talked about that. We, that was been covered on two or more shows, so. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Being contactee, you very quickly come to understand the thin veil of reality between the truly bizarre and the real, quote, UFO lore. Most people still chuckle. Oh, what they need to learn. All right. We are facing a period in the next 16 to 18 months that may be testing our true metal. I, I want to get to reading this stuff, but how much time? We, we still got, what, an hour and a half? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, and we got another half hour I'm just before having the fun break. talking with you. It, 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 it's not like, oh, we have to do an interview or we have to do this. But I do, I do need to get to reading, reading this material. Okay. What's all that conversation have to do with is the fact that the occult and the religious and the UFO and the scientific, they're all linked together. You can't have one without the other. That is how reality is on this planet. By the way, the ETs call this the planet of obstruction. Isn't that interesting? It is. Everything, everything's a struggle here. All right. Um, I want to finish a little baby son came about. Four and a half to five billion years ago, a large rock, a, 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 a huge asteroid, probably a planetary sized asteroid. Okay, I'll use that as a description. Came roaring out of the void. And it was targeted to intersect with the planet eclipse. And when you, you've been to a planetarium, when you look up and you see the sun, right? And then you see all the planets displayed. You know, you've seen a planetarium spread, everybody out there, right? I, I sure have. And you see the nine planets and you see the asteroid belt, you know, and you see Pluto, and you see everybody, everybody's out there. And but what you don't see is the blue-black giant, and you don't see Wormwood. Okay. Wormwood was born from a celestial tragedy that happened about four and a half to five billion years ago when this huge asteroid came smashing through the plane of the ecliptic of the solar system. And it was in opposite direction to its rotation. Okay. Our solar, our sun, all the planets, Everything in our solar system rotates counterclockwise. Rule science. Everything. And interesting, in, interestingly enough, the galaxies all swing counterclockwise, as do all the solar systems and all the star groups and all the galaxies. They all swing counterclockwise. Just reality. No one knows why, for sure. But that's it. Well, this object came smashing in at the opposing, it's like two freight trains, this planetary-sized rock, probably the size of Earth, but maybe larger, came smashing through the plane of the ecliptic, just like you see it up on a planetarium. And it hit, it hit several of the outer planets, destroying them. It may have dislodged, if there was a 12th planet, it may have dislodged Nibiru, from wherever its, its, its position was in orbit. If there was a 12th planet, this is when it happened. And when this rock came through, it had a head-on collision with Marduk. A head, this giant rocky planet Marduk is hit head-on of two freight trains with this huge rock. And it burst both of them into billions and billions and billions of pieces space debris would coalesce and became what we believe is the asteroid belt just outward from Mars okay 
it further came in and probably hit Earth or glanced at a blow. It, it's the blow that is believed by some, including Dr. Valentine and, and, and Charles Berlitz, that a huge piece of this planetary debris from Marduk and, and the space monster hit Earth approximately where the Mediterranean Sea is. And it was shaped like the Mediterranean Sea and punched a hole right smack into the Earth, creating the Mediterranean Sea trenches. And the water just rushed in. And that's what started the planet, the, the breakup of the continental landmass originally known as Pangaea. It was when Earth finally coalesced and became a land based planet. There was one huge continent that was called Pangaea. And you know, we can go through the whole thing and all the pieces come together, you know, bring the Earth. Sure. You know, awesome. a map and it all comes together. Well, that's all true. It's all true. Okay. So, if that's the case, that was a seminal point in the history of our planet because it started to further define the breakup of continents. Okay, what does all this have to do? Well, uh, as this huge piece of space debris is, is still careening inward towards speculations, but it does come back from the region of Orion and comes up and under the back side of the sun. That's why we really never get to see it that good. At least this time we didn't. We see it now, but with great difficulty and expensive photography. Well, well, here's what, let me, let me tell you what a, a few people um, kind of argue about that with me. And they say that, well, when people tell you it's in the back side of the sun or behind the sun, um, it's told to me, well, we go around the sun. So at what point, you know, at some point, we're, we should be on the same side. And that's that's what I get told by uh, by some out there. What, what do you say to, to something like well, that? Well, it's coming up. It's it's been coming up, and I believe now it's about ready to arc out again. And this arcing out will be on or about September 18, 2016, on or about that day, give or take 24 hours. And that day could signal <coughs> a major global earthquake. Um, I made a list of the things I'm most worried about. And it's a long, nasty list. And it's not based on fantasy or fiction. It's based on all the things that are collectively happening all at the same time this very evening somewhere on the planet. In other words, the list of conditions that we're going to talk about okay. will be manifesting to their completion somewhere on the planet. I'll leave a go at that. All right. Let's start by considering the facts of the world's overpopulation. I mean, just start there, for instance. Not, not that we can do anything about it, but just how about that one? Is that not big enough? Now we've got all this global warming debate, and as you know, I do not ascribe to either either global warming or global cooling, I'm, 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 I'm in the camp that suggests, and it's pretty much supported by fact, especially science fact, that they can't prove global warming is man-made. All they know is that there is, appears to be a sudden increase in CO2 emissions, which come from a number of things, including cows and, and gasoline engines and this and that. But nobody ever talks about the fact that when one single global big old jumbo volcano lets go like Vesuvius or or the hundred and twenty other did you know we have at least at least hundred and twenty major volcanoes at this time all erupting across the planet. No one's talking about it. 
And those are just. Can you name the top five? I don't think so. And those, we don't talk about that, Michael. Don't you dare talk about it now. Those are just the ones on oh. land, right? We're not even considering the ones under the ocean. Yeah. Right? Well, what's happening is the ring of fire is coming alive. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Maybe tonight would be good night to talk about the ring of fire. But I want to go on. So, <clears throat> my second one was this global warming initiative, which has been a real money maker for many, many, many people. We, won't, we don't have to name them. We already know who they are. And I believe that our planet is simply going through a state of very confusing signals from the sun. So let's start there. Let's go, let's go there, all right? Everything and anything that happens to this planet has to do with its connection to the sun. Without the sun... There would be no life on planet Earth. There would be no life on Earth. Earth would probably be a frozen void, completely. Its oceans would be solid ice, for thousands of feet thick. Without the sun, nothing good comes upon the Earth. I've been pr proposing since uh, how long do I been talking now? So eight, nine years at least, right? Seven years? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been seven years. All right. You know, after the book, the book's been released. It was released in, in 2007. The book we're talking about is The Arrival and Return of Planet X. And it covered a, a span of time from 1983 to the present. And the way I left the book in writing, I left the present to be looked at as any day following the last day you wrote the book. In other words, once you have read that book, and everything that you experience, which I'm going to talk about here in this one paragraph, you will experience by reading the book. And then when you're finished, you'll suddenly see it all play out before you. Because now you'll understand what's driving the planet to its apparent confusion and, and uh, <clears throat> undecidedness and, and <clears throat> weird winters and hot summers and changing ocean currents and and huge global impact uh, situations such as the jet stream being forced almost a thousand or more miles off its normal range of flow across the United States and around the rest of the planet. Look at Buffalo. Look at that. So it's seven to eight feet of snow in yeah. some areas. Yeah. There's obviously something wrong. And my sympathies go to Buffalo. I used to live in Chicago. I hated Chicago weather in the winter. It was dreary, Michael. Two months at a time, you never saw the sun. Never. Anyway, um, there's something really, really, really wrong with the weather systems that are driving this planet. Now, why aren't we talking? Why isn't the science? Why isn't NASA openly investigating that? What's causing these weather aberrations? Exactly. We all know what it is, but they won't. They won't discuss it. No such thing as global warming. There's no global cooling. Right now, we're going through phases of both super warming and super cooling, like we're experiencing at this moment. It's cold all the way down to Florida. That's very rare these days, or should be very rare. Now it's becoming quite common. So I think that there's no such thing as global warming. What's happening is the sun is being perturbed. Do you know what the word perturbations means? I certainly do. I've had six one, kids. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm talking about one heavenly body affecting the other because of its mass and its electromagnetic field. And what, you know, what we call them, one mass object, one huge magnet affecting another magnet. You see, we're one huge electrical magnet to the planet. It's, 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 if you only understood how brilliant it was, whoever designed, and Michael, can you hey, everybody out there, can you imagine the scope of the computer program that had to be designed to create just the Earth, just the Earth. Forget all the other planets in our in our solar system. Just the Earth. Yeah, yeah. It it, it, it came to a billion billions of years of, of uh, uh, environmental change, and and of course, you know, the planet grew and matured. It's probably our planet is probably 
somewhere between nine and a half and 12 billion years old as part of our solar system. So you have to understand how complicated the solar system is. All right. Oh, Michael, here we go. We're jumping off the bridge again. All right. 